suspect that some of you in this room may not be surprised to hear, hang on, let me just get the first image up, that I come from a very male-dominated family, and that's without even putting primogenitor in the frame. And it's all due to this man who looms over all of us, my great-great-great-grandfather, the first Duke of Wellington. And he's looming over, well, I feel as if he's looming over me even more this year because it's the bicentenary of the Battle of Waterloo. And in fact, one of the reasons I wrote my book was to bring the women in my family out of the shadows. And tonight, I want to bring some of the women who were at Waterloo out of the shadows, whose lives were affected by this very dramatic event in varying degrees. So to set the scene, 200 years ago, to the day, to the hour, the Duchess of Richmond was putting the finishing touches to a ball in Brussels. It would become, of course, one of the most famous balls in history, immortalized in Vanity Fair by Thackeray. The year before, at the end of the Peninsula War, Wellington had defeated Napoleon, and Napoleon was dispatched to Elba. But he had a series of careless minders, and when the English won, left to go to Florence, supposedly to see his doctor, but more likely, it appears, his mistress, he took his chance and escaped, landing on French soil on March the 1st, 1815. Wellington was at the Congress of Vienna when he heard the news, and the Tsar of Russia said to him, it is for you to save the world again. By early April, Brussels had become the center of gravity for the Allies, while Wellington established residence there and started to reassemble his army. While, of course, Napoleon with, was gathering his around him in France. There were a lot of expats already living in Brussels, and their numbers were swollen by royalist French fleeing Paris. Wellington's presence in the city was reassuring. Not only was he the hero of the Peninsula War, but the entire female population were in raptures to have such a celebrated and attractive man in their midst. The Duchess of Richmond was very cautious, but really wanted to have her ball. Duke, I, she said to Wellington, I do not wish to pry into your secrets, nor do I ask what your intentions may be. I wish to give a ball, and all I ask is may I give my ball? To which Wellington replied, Duchess, you may give your ball with the greatest safety without fear of interruption. And he was not being entirely disingenuous. He didn't know when he would finally confront Napoleon. In fact, he was planning his own ball due to take place a few days later. And more importantly, it was absolutely essential that all Napoleon's spies saw pleasure as usual. The dancing had begun when rumors began to circulate that Napoleon had crossed the border. When Wellington arrives at the ball, he confirms everybody's worst fears. Some of the men there left immediately to go and put on their uniforms. Others would go to the front in their evening clothes. There were tearful farewells, and the Duchess was absolutely desperately trying to persuade them all to have one last dance. And I suspect that she was pretty pissed off with Napoleon 
for, for, on top of everything else, ruining her evening. But more sensibly, one of her daughters remembered later that she was incredibly angry with one of the young men who was talking about honor and glory, and he was killed the following day. Now, Waterloo was less than 10 miles from Brussels. Britain had been at war with France for over 20 years, almost continuously, but the fighting had never been on British soil. So this was most British women that were there. It was their first experience of war and its aftermath. The reality and brutality of war was on their doorstep. On the eve of the battle, there was a terrible storm. This is Joanna Smith, who got married to one of Wellington's officers during the Peninsula War. She was only 14 at the time, but it was a real love match. And she could hardly bear to leave his side and spent the last night, the eve of Waterloo, with her husband on the battlefield. She was used to roughing it. But in the morning, he sent her back to safety. And of course, she wasn't the only woman on the battlefield. There were a lot of camp followers, often with children, who of course, other than being there to be with their husbands, there was normally about six to every hundred men. So there were quite a few of them. And of course, they provided services as washerwomen and feeding the men and nursing them, of course. The French army were a lot fairer, and they actually employed women in the army as cantiniers and vivandiers, as they were called. And these women would often find them fighting by the men. On Sunday, 18th of June, the first shot was fired at 11 a.m. One Private McMullen was was wounded, and his wife, who was pregnant, was, was beside him. He was a British private. She tried to drag his body from the battlefield. He was still alive, but she tried to drag him from the battlefield, but she was wounded herself. But by some miracle, they ended up in hospital in Antwerp, and when they returned to England, she gave birth to a daughter who had the dubious pleasure of having Waterloo as one of her names, um, but the slightly better advantage of the Duke of York standing godfather to her because he'd been so impressed by the bravery of her mother. Back in Brussels, women had been asked to bring in everything they could provide, blankets, linen, mattresses, and of course they were there to help and to nurse. And in fact, the mayor sent out a proclamation threatening the rich um, citizens of Brussels that if they didn't conform to this, he would send the sick and wounded round to their houses. And interestingly, sort of formalities between the sexes were, were dropped and because all the women, whatever class they were, were desperate to know from the men that were coming back from the battlefield wounded desperate for any news, any information that might give them some sense of how their husbands or lovers were. Fanny Burney, the seasoned uh, novelist and playwright, was in Brussels, and she wrote later of the terror engulfing the city and hearing the sounds of the battle, because it was so close, it was very, very vivid and described the arrival of the wounded and the maimed from what she called the field of slaughter. Some, of course, were treated on the battlefield, on the spot, and there was a medical station uh, about 500 yards behind Wellington's front lines, which was near the women's camp. And the, there were about 6,000 wounded men brought to to this station in the course of the day, 
Mary Gale was one of the women there, and her daughter, Elizabeth, who was four years old at the time, when she died in 1904, she was the last survivor of, of uh, Waterloo. And of course, she remembered helping her mother tend to the wounds. But her most vivid recollection was when her mother lifted the cloth off the face of, her, of a dead man, and she saw his eyes wide open, staring vacuously towards the battlefield. But the noise and the stench of death would have been absolutely horrific. And the wounds, as you can see from this, a lot of them were grotesque. The weaponry of the time was cannonballs, musket balls, swords, sabers, bayonets. In a matter of seconds, a limb could be severed. On the French side, there was one regular Engel. She was she married her husband, who was um, in the French army when she was 17 years old, fought beside him right through until Waterloo, where she witnessed her hus both her husband and her nine-year-old drummer boy son being killed in the battle. Amazingly, though she was bayoneted in her side, and shot in her neck, she survived and outlived her 20 children. And there was another woman who was known as Marie Tete Dubois, who was a cantonier. Here you see the cantonieres providing drink to the, to the French soldiers. By 9 p.m., the battle was over. In an area of three square miles, just a little over three square miles, 50,000 men, a few women, and 12,000 horses lay dead or dying. The field was literally carpeted with bodies. Where the fighting had been at its most intense, they were piled high. In Brussels and Antwerp, conflicting accounts had reached them as to who was winning the battle over the previous two, three days. But now they heard that the battle was over. Magdalene de Lancy had married less than three months before Wellington's quartermaster general. She didn't go to the ball. She preferred to spend the evening with her husband. And she went through this agonizing experience of hearing that he was alive, then dead, then he, she heard that he was definitely alive. When she reached him, it was clear that he was mortally wounded. She stayed for six days, never left his side. And later she wrote an account, which when Charles Dickens read it, he said, if I live for 50 years, I shall dream of it every now and then, from this hour to the day of my death with the most frightful reality. The reality, it seems, was all the more shocking because it came from a woman. There, there are, in fact, more accounts of Waterloo than any other battle before the First World War. Joanna Smith also wrote up her account of the battle she also believed that she was widowed, and when she approached the battlefield, she became completely hysterical, not surprisingly. Oh God, he's been buried, and I shall never again behold him. How can I describe my suspense, the horror of my sensations, my growing despair, the scene of carnage around me? She was one of the lucky ones. He was alive and well. Some of the bodies lay on the field for several days. The wounded, some of them went through the horrendous experience of waiting to be collected, surrounded by their dead comrades. For every man that died, there were women, as it were, standing behind him, whether it was his wife or his daughters, and of course, other children. <clears throat> 
and those women got very little help from the nation. But they had one thing to be thankful for, and that was that there was a sustained period of peace. I'm going to leave the last words to my ancestor. I hope to God he said to Lady Shelley, who was one of his admirers, I hope to God that I have fought my last battle. It is a bad thing to be always fighting. While in the thick of it, I am much too occupied to feel anything, but it is wretched just after. It is quite impossible to think of glory. Both mind and feelings are exhausted. I am wretched even at the moment of victory. And I always say that next to a battle lost, the greatest misery is a battle gained. Not only do you lose those dear friends with whom you have been living, but you are forced to leave the wounded behind you. To be sure, one tries to do the best for them, but how little that is. At such moments, every feeling in your breast is deadened. I am now just beginning to regain my natural spirits, but I never wish for any more fighting. His wish was to be granted. <laughs>